president pro tempore of the California State Senate and represents the largest senatorial district in California. He's a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley and is well versed in revenue and taxation, natural, natural resources, and labor and social welfare. And it is in that respect that I'd like to introduce to you Senator Howard Way. Thank you very much, Mark. Why don't, uh, thank you very much. Why don't you, if you're interested in listening, why don't you come down forward and we'll just have a very informal uh, uh, question and answer period here. Maybe I could even sit down. <laughs> <coughs> We're in the uh, schedule today throughout Southern California at various college campuses. Uh, this is one part of, the, of my job that I particularly enjoy. Uh, we hear so much these days about the generation gap and uh, I have told my people that I want to do everything possible that I can do to bridge this gap. I, I really feel that it does exist. Um, I would have to, uh, so I'm going to assume that uh, those of you who are here are interested in bridging this too and that you're also interested in, in helping, in helping us in California solve the problems that we face uh, in higher education uh, and many, many other areas. And what I really like to do uh, with a group such as this is to cast myself in the role of a listener much more than a speaker because so many young students that I talk to today, when I ask them the question, uh, what can I do to help? Uh, if they're very frank with me, they say, listen. Because I find that you have the feeling that those of us who are in positions of leadership and who are on the other side of this tremendous chasm, and I sometimes think it isn't as tremendous as we make it, you do have a feeling that we aren't listening to you. And uh, I want to do nothing to further that feeling, and that's why I have said uh, to my staff, I want to get on as many college campuses as I can, and I would much rather go there in a listening role than I would as a speaker. Uh, students tell me when, uh, and, and students are a very, very uh, straightforward, frank group that they are sick to the teeth of having, uh, and they use the word politician and they don't use it in a uh, particularly complimentary sense. They're sick to the teeth of having the politicians come on the campuses, uh, mouthing platitudes, mounting the stump and orating and really not uh, coming to grips with some of the problems that are b bothering them. And uh, so I, I certainly don't want to be in that role. So I think we have marked, we have what, 40 minutes or so? Uh, I will talk very briefly, uh, maybe 10 minutes, and then let's just have a question and answer period. And I'd like to have you ask any questions that are on your mind about state government, about higher education, about some of the current problems that exist here and uh, throughout the state. Students tell me that the thing that bothers them uh, as they continue their educational careers today is the fact that uh, so much of the course content and so many of the requirements that they have to meet uh, are not relevant to today's society and to today's problems. I spoke uh, this morning over at Pasadena City College to uh, a group of political science students and the course they were taking was called American Institutions. And this is a requirement that you all have to take in uh, our state colleges and universities. The course is named various things, but American institutions. And this reminded me that many, many years ago, back in the dark ages, when I went to Berkeley, I had to take American institutions. And if I had to name the course that was the most boring, that was uh, probably the most irrelevant that I took all during my college career, I think I'd have to put American institutions right up near the top. We had it right after lunch and uh, it was pretty hard to stay awake and uh, there was nothing in the course to keep us awake the way it was given by this particular professor. 
And I had a feeling that he had been giving it in the same way, with the same content, for at least 15 or 20 years, and I'm sometimes tempted to go back and see if he's still there delivering it in the same way. And uh, I, so we had a trick we used to play. We'd, uh, someone would bring, many of us were sleeping, someone, someone would bring an alarm clock to the class, and we thought it was really a big, big, we got a big kick out of setting off that alarm clock about midway through the lecture, and waking everybody up, but it didn't bother the professor at all. He kept right on droning and reading in the same <laughs> pedantic matter. So I, I mention this to emphasize that many of us are really concerned about this problem of relevancy, about our teaching techniques, about our course content, to be sure that we are updating that we are using the best techniques that are available to us. I read an article the other day about this problem of relevancy, and I thought this fellow had a pretty good solution. He said, I'm going to found a university, and uh, for want of a better title, I'm going to call it Survival U. And uh, what a university really needs today to be relevant is to have a cause that will bind all the students and the faculty and the taxpayers and concerned citizens together in a common goal. And he said, what could be more common and what could be more critical than this matter of survival? So we will call it Survival U. And uh, the Department of Biology will dwell and emphasize on the problems that face us as we continue to pollute our environment. The problem of the uh, Department of Engineering will teach uh, how to build dams and where to build them, but it will also teach where not to build dams. The uh, Earth Sciences Department, for example, uh, could, could dwell and emphasize what we're doing to our resources in America today, how we are dissipating them, how we're using up uh, valuable land to build freeways, and how we uh, destroy the natural habitat uh, in a many times indiscriminate and unwise way. The uh, Mathematics Department could, could really emphasize uh, uh, the actual meaningful value and the essence of our gross national product, and so on and so on. So every department would, would deal with a subject that comes right to the heart of a matter that is of concern to all of us, and it's our survival. So we'll call it Survival U, and it will really be relevant. Now, as I read this article and as I mentioned it to you, it occurs to me that really a great many of these opportunities to study and to be concerned about what is relevant today, 1969, are available to you as students here at UCLA and to our students generally throughout America. Uh, you have to develop an attitude, I think, to, to help us bring this relevance to our higher education programs. And I see signs that we're doing this, and you do this by, by responsible dissent, by continuing to point up to faculty and to administration that you are concerned about what you're learning and the direction you're going. And by and large, I find, and incidentally, I, I like to make this little poll, how many of you here today are in liberal arts or liberal arts majors? engineering, any engineers, mathematics. Generally speaking, uh, the students who are most concerned about this problem of relevancy are in our liberal arts schools. I guess it's sort of a natural thing. The, the, the people who are in engineering, who are in science, who are in mathematics, pretty well know the direction they want to go. And uh, they don't have this feeling of irrelevancy and perhaps lack of direction that those of you have who are in liberal arts. So our problem is here. We, we continue to, to meet uh, significant resistance on the part of administrators to a degree and educators when we try to come to grips with 
the problem of using uh, our teaching ability and updating our courses, uh, we meet this opposition because, uh, you know, most of us, particularly when we're a little older, tend to resist change. Uh, but we have to move in this direction to uh, make better use of television so that the master teacher can teach uh, 250 students instead of maybe 25. And uh, we, we will continue to do this. So I will only urge you to be patient. I hope that we don't have to s establish a survival you to convince you that we can have an educational program that is relevant to today and to your problems and it will prepare you to, to help us solve the problems that we face in the last third of this 20th century. I think 1969, if uh, when we look back on it 20 or 30 years from now, will be a significant year for, if for no other reason than the fact that it was this year that for the first time man saw himself from outer space. And he saw this blue globe. And he suddenly realized, at least this was the reaction I had as I watched uh, that landing on the moon and saw these pictures, I suddenly realized that we're all on this blue globe together. And what we do to it is going to be determined by all of us. And somehow or other, we're going to have to work together to solve the problems. Young and old, all races, all creeds, because I think as we looked at that little globe, suddenly things were put in this perspective at least that we must get along or we will perish. And so uh, survival you has some real meaning to us and, and you young students are going to be the ones that will have to solve the problems that face us in the last third of the century. Now, uh, so much for a general discussion. What would you like to talk about? Uh, yeah. Senator, Senator, about relevancy. Um, I, I appreciate, I fully appreciate the miraculous achievement of the United States and of man in reaching the moon. And it's fine and wonderful. Through reaching the moon, we, we come upon this new perspective with all of us together on the blue globe. But I have a feeling that there are many of us here on the earth who already have reached this idea without the trip to the moon. What I can't understand is um, what's the relevancy in, in moon rocks here as compared to a student who was turned away at college? I, I can't see the relevancy in having a pile of moon rocks when there are so many students who can't get into schools due to lack of funds, that it infuriates me. I'm a theater arts major, and I've come here because UCLA has supposedly one of the best departments in the United States, but in all truth, it's rapidly declining due to lack of funds, and it's gotten to the point where we have to pay in our classes. We have to hand out cold cash to take the classes that uh, to, to replenish the funds that otherwise should have been there, you know, through our taxes, etc. But our taxes are going to, uh, to buy the supply for a rocket to reach the moon, and I can't understand the relevancy of that at all. You mean what you really don't understand is the importance of why do we place so much importance on that when educate, we could use that money for education and so on? Yeah, right. Let's mm -hmm. solve our problems here at home before mm -hmm. we go. Well, I think, uh, first of all, to keep our think let's keep our thinking real straight on this problem. Uh, I don't know that we are turning away any students. <laughs> we are saying to students, you can't go to certain schools, but we still have universities and state colleges in California that uh, can take students. And so when we make the general statement that we're turning students away, it's not accurate quite. What? But uh, we are saying that perhaps UCLA has said, you cannot, uh, they've closed enrollments for next fall, am I right on that? But at the same, so our problem is this, that when we, when we in California said many years ago that we're going to provide practically a free education for everyone from kindergarten through college, uh, 
we really didn't realize what a tremendous financial burden this was going to become, and that we'd have so many, and that the costs would be so high. Now, uh, people say, and I think you didn't say this, but I hear it a lot, if we can afford to put a man on the moon, certainly we can afford to have uh, a good educational system. Certainly we can afford to see that our welfare programs are adequate so that no one's going hungry, and so on and so on. And this then implies that, that, uh, that because we're putting people on the moon, we're doing nothing in this other area. Uh, I often get this. And I like to emphasize that, that this is a little unfair because we're doing a great deal. We're spending increasing amounts on welfare and on Medi Medi-Cal and, and health problems. And also, uh, the, the appropriation for higher education goes up sharply year after year after year. For example, we're spending more money in California per capita than any other of the ten big industrial states that have the same problems we do. Uh, the, the question then comes down to priorities, doesn't it? A and this is where, where the voice of the people have to be heard. To date, in Congress and in the Senate, there has been support for the space program. Uh, if we are going to curtail that program, then the voice of the people will have to be heard, and I think it will. But I just wanted to, to emphasize that we are doing a great deal in these other areas. We need to do more. Yet the ratio is yeah. the same. I mean, you know, year after year, we may spend more on education, but then we're spending more also on the space program. Yeah. Well, we're actually, I see signs that we're cutting back on that. If you. Uh, uh, if you were aware of what's going on at Aerojet General in Sacramento, for example, they have some uh, 15, 16,000 fewer employees than they had six or seven years ago. Uh, many of our de plant defense plants are cutting back, you see, too. Yes, uh, it's well, but no, the expenditures are going down, and you'll notice we've had some defense budget cuts, too, in recent uh, weeks and months. So there is, I think we are tending to, to uh, the pendulum's tending to swing the other way. Oh, uh, yes, and I want to emphasize this, that there is a feeling I detect on college campuses that uh, uh, in Sacramento there is no sympathy and no understanding for our higher educational programs and their financial needs, and this really isn't true. We, you, you have a great many friends, and we are aware of the problem, but again, it just comes down to we have so much money and we have these priorities, and it makes when someone has to make some very difficult decisions. Yes. I well understand, Senator, that uh, there, the state has a great many needs it has to meet. And uh, when the governor came in four years ago, for example, the state was in a very severe financial crisis. But I don't understand why, when uh, University, you know, UCLA is turning away people simply because of the bureaucratic mix-up. Well, now, let's see. What, what is the situation here? We haven't turned anybody away this quarter, have we? Uh, I think it's for spring. spring. For spring, or is it for next? Closed enrollment for spring. For spring, yeah, yes. all right. Now, this I understand is simply because of some sort of mix-up. They failed to anticipate the number of new students who are coming in. But if I remember correctly, from last year's university budget, uh, there was a large amount of funds cut from the recommendations, and almost all of it came from future building. Now, if enrollment is going up so sharply and unexpectedly, uh, why is it that when we have a budget surplus, we're uh, cutting back on, on expansion? Well, again, now let's, let's keep our thinking straight here. I, I always hate to use this word surplus, because a surplus really the meaning of this word just depends upon who's defining it. We don't have a surplus in the state budget. We're spending more money every day and every year, and we have done this for the last six or seven years, than we're taking in. Now, this is a fact. Now, we have financed the building that, that we need for higher education on our university and state college campuses with bonds. And we are in a very critical position here because of inflation and because we can no longer sell any bonds at the legal rate of interest. This is really hurting. Uh, we will have a ballot measure next June which will allow us to pay more than 5% for G general obligation bonds and hopefully maybe this will relieve this bind. So this has, did, did I answer your question or I've lost? 
this is why we have not, we've been a little bit handicapped on meeting space needs. And so we have to challenge our, our institutions to use the space they have to better advantage by, for example, we're going to have to, and I know that you, you're going to be a little unhappy, we're going to have to encourage more of you to go to school in the summertime. We tried it at Berkeley last, uh, last summer, and we hoped that we might get as high as 40% of the students who were in the other three quarters to come the summer quarter. We got 20%. So we are, we're faced with a situation where it, it could be possible that we would have to say to our college students, uh, you cannot go to certain schools, but we can, we can accommodate you at others. And uh, we may have to say when they can go, too. It's tough, I know, but uh, we have we have uh, vacancies for students now at Irvine. At Ri I'm naming the university campuses: Irvine, Riverside, Santa Cruz, so on. Uh, some of Davis, I believe. So, I don't think so. well, I don't know what is the situation at Davis. Davis will be fulfilled this fall. This fall. First time. Mm. Uh, We'll continue to build, and, and uh, we'll just have to continue to ask the cooperation of all concerned of making the very best utilization we can of all our facilities and also of the educators' time. We have a great many educators that could be teaching more students in a given period of time than they are. This, uh, this specialization routine, for example, gets uh, a little bit tough. For example, we start teaching American history, and. Pretty soon somebody's teaching the history of the Civil War and then the history of the Civil War from 1861 to 62 and someone else. And, and we find a, a very competent uh, teacher, professor, perhaps with 20, 25 students when you get into this situation. This hurts. Um, I haven't noticed it being a history major myself. It seems to me that my classes are all extremely... All getting uh, larger, yeah. <laughs> well, we do... Uh, UCLA, of course, is... Uh, uh, is one of the big institutions and it's one of the institutions where the problems are critical. Uh, but uh, with regard to this uh, budget surplus I mentioned, I don't follow state government particularly closely. I'm afraid I'm like most of the apathetic public. I only note the headline once in a while that says uh, budget surplus of 100 million or whatever, you know. Uh, could you explain to me exactly why it is that we're getting such a misleading impression from the newspapers? Well, let's see. It's probably due to a degree to uh, the very nature of, uh, of uh, politics in America and in a democracy. It is, it is almost standard practice for those who are in to point with pride and those who are out to view with alarm, isn't it? And uh, so when you, uh, if you are in, uh, you would like to say that we have a surplus. This was done by Governor Brown, and it has been done, and I have been now uh, with Governor Reagan. Uh, so then you have to say, well, what do you mean a surplus? And uh, so then you get into the technical problem of, well, we need a cash reserve for liquidity. And uh, some of our experts will say it should be 190 million, and others are say, will say you don't need it at all. So uh, it would be very possible for those who want to view with alarm to say that we really have a surplus now because the present administration has said it is good fiscal management to have a surplus for a cash liquidity. They are. Uh, fiscal experts call it. In other words, our both outgo and income in the state has tremendous peaks and valleys. Certain months our income is down and our uh, outgo is up and vice versa. So good management says that you keep this reserve. So you could call it a surplus or you could say that it is a reserve for cash liquidity. The budget, no, by annually, and the budget has to be balanced every year, but we have been balancing it now, as I indicated earlier, for the last six or seven years by borrowing money, and borrowing money by selling bonds. And now the bond market, we haven't been able to sell any bonds for several months, and we have some real problems that I know. That was the projection at the beginning of the year, or whenever it was, that there would be a surplus of X amount of dollars based on anticipation of bond sales, or what? 
No, uh, the, I don't know who, who predicted that there would be a surplus. Yeah, but, but for good management reasons, that June 30th, the end of our fiscal year, uh, fiscal experts would say we do need a surplus of 120 million or 150 million for ongoing expenses, you see, to meet and to meet, shall we say, emergencies. Now, we're having, right now, we're having to do some real, uh, shall I say, juggling to keep the California Water Project going, which will deliver water by 1972 down here to you in Southern California because of our inability to sell bonds. Uh, I don't want to get into that, but uh, uh, this whole fiscal picture is one that is highly complex as it would be bound to be with a budget that is $6.2 billion. Uh, I don't, as I said, the demands uh, that higher education will continue to make on the taxpayer in California are going to mean several things. I think it could mean that we may have to say to you that you can't go where uh, you want to, all, all of you. Uh, we might have to specialize in certain areas nor when you want to go. And uh, uh, also, and I know this is uh, controversial, I think it's inevitable that we're going to ask, have to ask those students and parents who have the ability to pay a higher percentage of the cost of their education. And I think we can do it without working any hardship on those students who do need financial assistance through a wider and uh, more comprehensive scholarship program. But we do have, and it's particularly true, and I can't remember the figures, uh, here at UCLA, uh, we had some figures on the annual income of the parents of the students, and it was pretty amazing. We didn't feel it would work any hardship on them to, to pay a little more for the cost of their education, yes. Senator, one of the problems I see in my own experience, friends of mine, uh, with this type of analysis is that in many cases, I think it far more than the public or the general public realizes, the students themselves are putting most of the cost of their education without their parents contributing. Now, if California is going to base tuition on the student's parents' income, this is going to work a great hardship on a certain class of students who usually are the class of students which supports their education, you know, by themselves without help from their parents. Now, I think this is one thing. I've never seen any news coverage on this, on a discussion of this in the Senate or in state government at all. I think this is one thing legislatures should consider, that, that basing tuition on parents' income isn't always the uh, most fair way to do it. I don't know how to get around it. Yeah, I was wondering what could, what other measurement could we have? But this is, but this is true in my own personal experience that often parents don't contribute as much as the state government seems to think they do. Well, the point I was making was, and I can't remember the figures, but I was, I remember being amazed at the percentage of students at UCLA whose parents' income was twenty thousand or more per year. Now, is it safe to assume if they're making twenty thousand that they should contribute a little more? Oh, I don't, I don't know, know, sir. I, I don't know. I, I don't, I really don't know. I don't think so. It, you don't think they of, should? No, I, I don't think it's fair to assume that the parents are contributing to the students' education. No, but I mean, is it fair to ask them with that, with that annual income to maybe pay another 50 or $100 a year additional fees? This is, you see, all, all that's been done to date, the one raise was how much? It was rather insignificant last year. It was more than $30. That $30, a, $30 a quarter. A quarter. Yeah, That's so 120, 120. Raised from 78 to uh, they went up that much. They went up yes, $30. Sir, they did. I'm so, a graduate student, and that's what it cost. Well, so then it's on, on the basis of three quarters, you had $90, $100 a year. Now, right. if a student is, parents are making 20000 or more a year, I can't believe that this additional $100 is going to work any undue hardship on them. Well, what about if this? It's, it's a, what about if it's a student who, who pays his fees? That, then, I mean, then, the poorest person in the world, as far as I can see, above above Mexican Americans and Negroes, is is, is the graduate student, <laughs> <laughs> and yet he's he's expected to pay even more. Now, now, you know, when I when I make a, a, you know three hundred bucks a month uh, scraping along on our Asia, uh, 
an extra hundred dollars a year makes a hell of a lot of difference mm -hmm. and it hurts and uh, I know personally of uh, several cases of students who that hundred dollars made a difference as to you know whether they could continue in the university or not People we have, you know, as lucky as yeah. me to get an RA. Yes. Yeah. Well, see, what's RA? Uh, research, uh, research, and, assistant. research assistant. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm. A, I have a son who just has been a TA for two years, a San Jose State teacher, and he's married. And I know the struggle he ha he's had. But the point is that we we don't want to handicap you in this area. But somehow or other, with those people who have the ability to pay, uh, we have to ha ask their help and then work out a program and you can help us in this area so that you for example and other graduate students are not unduly harmed this is the problem you see we know that there are with, with the affluence we have in america that there are people who will not be hurt at all that can help us meet this load that is getting very very oppressive on the taxpayer of the state of california well, perhaps we can shore up some of the loopholes in the uh, state and, um, uh, you know, federal income right. tax. Right, and give them credit, for example, on their income tax for money they spend uh, for their children's education. Could be, yeah. I'd like to suggest a source of funds Good. to prevent this. Uh, there's a new Senate office building being built in Sacramento, I believe, at uh, an incredible cost to the taxpayer. I believe each, each office in the building is uh, as large as or larger than the average three three room house in the state mm. of California, mm. and each office has its own uh, bathroom. Now I can understand uh, that you might be busy enough where it might be difficult to walk down the hall to the bathroom. But I wonder if uh, you and some of the other senators would be willing to volunteer to, to make that extra trip so that those funds could be. I transferred. have good news for you. <laughs> One of the first things I did shortly after May 13th when I was elected pro tem was to shelve all plans for the $63 million office building for legislators, <laughs> take the model down that was downstairs, and what did I tell you to do with that, Jim? I've forgotten, but put it, put it in, moth, in the mothballs, and uh, there will be no twin towers built for legislative offices uh, in Sacramento as long as I have any voice in it, until we have used the space that we have, we have to do the same thing that I'm telling educators that they must do to use the facilities we have to much better advantage. This was ridiculous. Yes? But to get back to this problem of tuition, I think to continue the same line of discussion, I think maybe one of the more fair proposals that has been made so far is to make the tuition based on the student's own future income. Mm -hmm. Rather than, I think it's grossly unfair to base a student's tuition on his parents' income, which may or may not have a relationship to the, stu the money the student has. You know, if you if you follow my, my no, I don't follow you there. Well, I really don't. I, well, from personal experience, I have two friends, both of whom had parents who made well over ten thousand dollars a year, who put themselves through school at the University of California, Berkeley. Now, if these two students, neither one of which received any money at all from their parents, had had to pay, say, $300 or $400 a year tuition, they would not have been able to finish school at that point. And the guy, because of our draft laws, would have had to drop out of school, and he subsequently would have been drafted, you know, without finishing his education, or maybe he would have gotten back. But the point is that in some homes in America, some homes don't believe in contributing to this, their sons or daughters' education. Then they're not placing a very high value on it. No, they're not. But still, the student himself should not be penalized because their parents, who, who may have a great deal of money, don't put a very high value on it. You know, I know this, and uh, so hence, the tuition which should be charged shouldn't be based on the parents' on parents' income. You know, because of this, you know, this relationship. And the same thing, well, myself, I'm married and I'm a graduate student. I really don't expect my parents to help support me. You know, it's kind of ridiculous for me to go out and get married and still expect help from my parents. So I don't feel that my tuition should be based on my parents' income because that, that bears no relationship to me anymore. Well, you're now an adult. You're, I assume you're, you're 21 and you're married and you're kind of on your own. This is another problem. But 
I hate to believe that. Still pays tuition. Yes, yeah, well, but I, basically though, my problem is this, you used the figure 10,000, I used 20 because I remember the percentage of parents here at UCLA whose income was 20,000 or up. I just have trouble reconciling the fact that those people somehow or other, we should be able to stimulate them to, to contribute a little more to the cost of educating their youngsters. Now, uh, you, you mentioned this other plan of, of, of uh, uh, what do we call it, earn, learn, and reimburse. This has been before us every session for several years. Uh, there's been some, it's been very controversial. This is geared on later on, you get a loan, you, you get your education, and you repay it over a period of years down the road. What's your reaction to that? Uh, yes. Yeah, well, that bill has six percent interest, which is compounded annually. By the time you get around to paying it, you pay like you know. Did it? I was there an interest a, charge in pay this? A small oh. Principal and tremendous amount oh. Of interest. Yeah. It, it seems to me that that you know uh, people, legislators, uh, and you know people who are for this, uh, forget that you know society at large you know, benefits one hell of a lot from having. Uh, the, the population uh, go on to uh, higher education and that uh, not only does does business uh, uh, benefit but but practically every uh, institution in our society benefits from from uh, the youth of the country um, going to going to the university and it doesn't it seems to me like I, I personally don't feel that the major institutions, business institutions, are carrying their fair share in the, in the tax load. Um, and I think that maybe this should be a, a source of, of uh, income. But don't forget that the university um, uh, not only trains people for specialized positions in the labor force, but it also keeps uh, young people out of the labor force uh, during that period so that, uh, you know, that uh, un unemployment isn't uh, increased, and we don't have unrest in the streets. So there's there's really a uh, a very best uh, a, a very uh, you know basic uh, interest uh, in in the larger institutions as well. Yeah, well, I, I think it's well to emphasize those points, and I I want to assure you that we're not unaware of them, uh, but the problem is getting. Uh, I've been in the Senate now for eight years, and every year this, this critical problem of financing higher education gets a little more critical, and we have to find some answers. If, if, the, if the rank and file are willing to continue to support this program uh, on the basis that we have been well and good, but we keep getting more and more indications that they're not, and this is the problem. Yes. I think probably part of the reason the rank and file may be a little restless, and I don't blame them, you know, is that the fact is that, as you mentioned, there's no indication that there's any understanding on the part of the state government or of the role that higher education plays in California's economic development. I mean, we didn't get large aircraft factories in California because of the good weather. I think we got them there because of our educational system. Because the well, they, weather helped, of course. Yeah, probably no doubt. But uh, also, some but they were able to draw. Influence. Yeah, they were they were able to draw a very high caliber of labor, you know, due to our, our fine educational development. And I think that education has played a primary part in in California's development. And I don't think this is realized by. Uh, I yeah, this sort of amazes me, and I find it on most college campuses. This feeling that in Sacramento there is almost a hostile atmosphere for higher <laughs> education. It's not true, uh, really. Well, I'm not. I'm not talking so much as about sex, Sacramento as I am about the restless taxpayer who thinks that the kids in the university system aren't doing any any good to anybody. And I think a large part of this restless restlessness of the taxpayer is brought about because of some of our leaders in state government who find it easier to blame some of the problems of society on the on the students rather than you know someplace else. I haven't seen anyone in state government recently come out and say it's because of California's educational system that we've had such fine economic development. They're usually saying things like, uh, you know, students, well, I don't know, I'm not going to say, but, but, you know, we get general indication that students aren't very highly regarded. Well, it's not true. I, 
Uh, I have stated many times the very thing that you just stated because of our quality educational program. But somehow or other, I, uh, you know, the, that doesn't make newsprint really. If you you got to be harping and criticizing, I guess, to make it yes. I was just going to say, time and time again, you say we have friends in, in Congress. Why, why don't they make themselves known? I mean, we have what? We the, the students or the universities education has friends in Oh, Florida, friends. But, uh, in, in Sacramento. Oh, in yeah. Sacramento. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, who are they? Uh, uh -huh. You know, I, <laughs> do they come and go in the night or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like to think that I'm a friend of higher education, so I'll name one, and I'll name a few <laughs> more. You have, uh, uh, It's marvelous. Yeah. You know, well, I, I'm just wondering about the advisability of being specific with names, uh, you know, uh, politically. Well, another but, question. but there are many, believe me, and and the enemies, those who you feel uh, have an ad uh, that are opposed to higher education, are those who are concerned and express themselves uh, about the militants and about some of the activities of a very few on our campuses. This creates a very, you know, you, we are guilty here of a very human trait and 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 on the other hand i think you as students are guilty of it many times too of generalizing you know we a few students cause a furor and we are some of us if we don't stop and think are inclined to say well all students are a bunch of militants and uh, activists and they don't deserve our support and so on and so on now on the other hand i think you generalize as students many times and say well those politicians in sacramento and washington aren't interested in education and aren't interested in us when it's a very few of us who are vocal and you tend to, to bracket us all with them. So let's keep our, again, keep our thinking straight here. You have a lot of friends in government and uh, who are dedicated to seeing that our higher education program continues to be a quality one. Really. Well, when you go back to Sacramento, will you carry this word with you? We'd really like to hear them, you know, when we're, when we're put on the firing line. Mm -hmm. Well, we, you see, we have a problem. Uh, as I said, I like to come on campuses, and how and we've got 35 to 50 people here today. There aren't 100 people in all of this big university here that even know I'm here today. You know, I haven't made I haven't made one little ripple in the total feeling that the students at UCLA have about Sacramento. They don't know I'm here. Uh, how do you, how do I uh, how do I really you know why have why don't we have more people here today I don't know and I'm not fingering you at all Mark. I just but uh, if I was late. here what paper comes out later well no but if I was here to kick up a big fuss about something to take on and be uh, you know something and sell newspapers we could probably fill a, an auditorium but uh, this is what's difficult to sell so just remember this that. You do have a lot of friends, and we are dedicated to seeing that the educational program in California continues to be a good one, and that you even have the materials for your drama department. And this is tough, you know, uh, to justify funds for something like that. It's always tough. I, I sit on the Senate Finance Committee for several years where we go line item by line item right down the budget of the state colleges and universities. And when we come to to the arts, uh, you know, it's really tough to get money as compared to the science department and the engineering and so on. Uh, our time's probably up, isn't it, Mark? It's one o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You've uh, stimulated me, and I hope I've given you a few uh, ideas at least. Thank you.